so I mentioned I mentioned we're in our 10th year. We're also in a phase of strategic thinking and planning and rearticulating our vision uh, in a large part because we are very aware that the name of our association is more limiting than the scope that we have for this association. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that the term citizen uh, causes harm in many situations, and we're very aware of that. But there are also perceptions about the different kinds of practices and what they look like, um, especially given the traditions that have a very long history in places where they use other terms. Um, I will say that my the vision that I brought to this work and my research has been grounded in understanding the research relationships and what they look like and the dimensions of practice that uh, make that possible. And one of the uh, papers that I have published has brought these terms into conversation, uh, looking at relationships that are uh, contributory um, or top-down, science-driven, collaborative, and co-created, all of which, um, no matter who is driving that process or informing that process, they are all still at their heart um, involve these partnerships where the engagement is critical and the research is critical, um, no matter the context. So with these three terms, we've also started using the term the sciences, contributory, collaborative, co-created. Uh, sometimes people see that as citizen science, community science, um, but there are even more terms, many of which don't start with C. So this is this is what we reference. Um, I will say that I, I also wanted to briefly share the 10-year-old vision that I brought to um, working with this association and getting it off of the ground, which is just building some infrastructure for sharing and exchanging those ideas um, online through a peer-reviewed journal. Um, sorry, give me a second. I need to take my earbuds out as the uh, battery is dying. Um, the what this looks like right now is a peer-reviewed journal called Citizen Science Theory and Practice, which spans all disciplines and perspectives, publishing uh, about the practices that make this work. We have a recent special collection that focused on biomedical citizen science. Um, other special collections reveal uh, targeted areas of work, and then individual publications cover a lot more of that, everything from looking at the outcomes of the process to looking at implications for engagement and policy. Um, and this may become relevant when we hear from uh, Mark about the American Geophysical Union because AGU has just launched a journal called Community Science. Um, and we're, it, we're talking a lot about how these two journals relate. Um, Online, some of the tools that we offer include a, a recently launched data ethics toolkit, which helps people look at um, and intentionally approach the complex ethical dimensions that can arise when um, looking at partnered research. Uh, there's a lot of depth there and some really exciting things forthcoming in relationship to that. Um, and then just briefly, I will mention a very new partnership that closes the loop in a way and advances work um, that is just getting started. Uh, Vincent Martin, um, who introduced me to Natalie, is part of our Environmental Justice Practitioners Working Group, which has just been awarded a small grant to help develop a similar set of tools that are uh, can be leveraged to negotiate and ensure equitable research partnerships, particularly in this dimension where uh, the power differential is really huge between scientific institutions who are often afforded the money and the attributions and so forth, whereas a lot of the expertise and knowledge and leadership um, is within communities where this work is, is taking place. Um, the last thing that I'll say before closing out is that a lot of this 
comes together in our now annual conferences. We're convening in May for the first time since 2019 in person, um, and we'd love to connect with any of you there who might be interested or just otherwise uh, stay in contact if this is an area of work that you um, pursue yourself. We'd love to learn from you um, and think about ways that we might be uh, a better connected to the community of expertise that's uh, within APHA. Thank you so much. That's really, really um, great uh, introduction. And I think you know we look forward to talking with you more for sure. With that, I'm just going to switch gears to ISSE. And we have Dr. Andrea Baccarelli with us today. He's the Leon Hess Professor and Chair of the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at Columbia University, Mailman School of Public Health and serves as the president of the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, a global association that impacts research, training, and policy. Dr. Baccarelli is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and has been included in the Web of Science list of highly cited um, world's most influential scientists the past, past decade. So very honored to have you here with us today and look forward to learning about ISSE. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. That is really great. Uh, Want to check you can see my slides now. That works, all right? So the uh, yes, I have some slides to discuss ISE, and um, I start by saying that, as the name uh, suggests, that we are uh, an association of uh, epidemiologists who want to advance the science, training, and policy related to environmental health. And really, we want to promote uh, science, develop new methods and research, uh, and uh, make our world a better place. Um, here are some data about us. We have more than 1,500 members. So we have experienced uh, a growth over uh, the past few years, in particular. Uh, um, environmental health seems to be growing everywhere, and our membership increased quite a bit. 24% of the members are students and uh, everyone comes from 70 plus countries around the world. Though more than half of our members are in the United States. There is still a large constituency here. Uh, we have uh, chapters in six regions in six different continents. And we have committees that, uh, that uh, range uh, from ethics to policy, to membership, to annual conference that help us going. And we also have awards for different types of investigators. So if you want to nominate anyone who does environmental epidemiology for awards, please check our webpage. The, the other thing I wanted to share, and this is really something perhaps we can have a discussion about synergies, is that we are doing quite a bit uh, to help uh, our members in different areas. For instance, we have a peer editing program, uh, which is about editing manuscripts and grants. Uh, to, and we provide assistance to uh, researchers who are either residing in low and middle income countries, or if they are in uh, high income countries, like in the United States, those who are from um, underrepresented ra racial groups. We have uh, a writing accountability group that uh, help uh, uh, members to participate in a community of peers who want to share experience with writing papers and grants. We have a YouTube channel with a lot of videos. And then there's the global education videos. And also we have a mentorship program uh, in North America where we uh, have mentors to make themselves available nationwide to junior investigators, either assistant professors or uh, postdocs usually, to help them with topics uh, to develop their careers. We also do a lot in terms of sharing knowledge and uh, educating the community. So lots of uh, synergies, perhaps also with the previous speaker association uh, about uh, policy. We, we create policy and advocacy statements. We uh, promote ethics uh, through our ethics committee and often write position papers on that. And we are really active to make science accessible. So we really do a lot of work on communication and a lot of work also to disseminate science. Um, 
we have a very active student and new researchers network. Uh, it's a platform for them to connect with each other, to do events, and, uh, and we have different ways to connect. And uh, finally, uh, we have a few partnerships and collaborations. Um, so ISE is uh, in official relationships with the World Health Organization as a non-state actor. We are uh, partnering with the Pan American Health Organization. This work done by our uh, uh, Central and South America chapter. Um, they are partnering with them for a regular webinar series. And uh, we also collaborate frequently with the European Respiratory Society, particularly in relation to air pollution research. Um, finally, I want to say we started six or seven years ago in anti-racism group that is very active as well at the annual conference. We have a lot of forums and a lot of activities and seminars. This is um, a picture from our uh, conference in Greece, in Athens last year, last September actually, where we had a very interesting panel and presentations uh, from a global perspective, people actually from uh, Europe, South America and the United States about uh, uh, race and racism in academia and outside academia. And um, finally, I want to invite everyone to the, our next conference, which is going to be in Taiwan uh, in September. And uh, is the uh, conference number 35 we have. And we will be speaking about connecting the East and the West, uh, one health in one planet. So this is all I had for, as an introduction and um, of course we are on social media and if anyone wants to connect with us you can find our website and our email over there and uh, of course you can write to me also directly and i'm happy to put my email in the chat as well so thank you so much i look forward to our discussion at the end of the session thank you dr baccarelli it's really nice of you um so I really appreciate the introduction to ISS, ISEE, and we look forward to continuing that conversation, hopefully collaborating as well. Okay, we're going to pivot a little bit to um, the National Environmental Health Association. We have Gina Baer, who's the Associate Director of Program and Partnership Development. Gina has been a registered nurse for her 25 years and is also an environmental health specialist. She has a strong background in infection control, food safety, and emergency preparedness. Gina helps manage NIHA's cooperative agreement with the CDC, which supports a broad range of environmental workforce projects. Welcome, Gina, to our panel. Sorry, my computer okay. is completely freezing up. So I will. It's Friday. We can understand. <laughs> try to get through this and see if I can share again. Is it sharing at all? It is. Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Bear with me here. So yes, my name is Gina Bear, and I'm the associate director at the National Environmental Health Association, or NEHA for short. And I really appreciate being here with all of you today. Um, though many in the public may not recognize it, I don't think I have to tell this group here that environmental health is definitely one of the foundations of public health. And as you can see in this slide here, that nearly a quarter of deaths are due to health risks in the environment. Um, as an association, everything we do really is to build and sustain and empower um, the environmental health workforce so that they're really equipped and prepared to protect the health of communities across the country. Um, the environmental health workforce is actually comprised of over 14,000 professionals. Um, and in the US, that's the second largest workforce in public health, um, second only to nursing, really. And NEHA, as a membership organization, we have right now about over 6,800 members. Um, this map illustrates. 
sorry. It looks like your slides aren't um, forwarding along. I think, I don't know if you sent them to Charles or if you want to send them to me. I could, maybe I can try if, if there's images you want to make sure people are seeing. It's, it's stuck on your um, title slide. Oh, so weird. It is, um, I wonder if it's a bandwidth thing. And I actually, just to clarify, I didn't get your slides because there was some, I don't know what happened if it was in Gmail or there's some technical issues. So I just have a picture, I have a picture of your um, logo from Neha. that's all. Uh, well, um, perhaps then to just pivot, maybe I'll just be more descriptive um, and I can try to send the, the um, presentation again afterwards so that we can share that with folks. Um, my Thank apologies, you. I don't know why it, it isn't moving along um, for you all. But anyway, so what this, I have a map up right now and it shows um, all of the US, uh, Alaska, Hawaii, and also some territories. And last year um, in 2020, 22 alone, we supported and partnered jurisdictions on um, 768 projects, um, pretty much in every state minus Hawaii, as well as Guam and the US Virgin Islands. Um, part also of how we support public health overall um, in the environmental public health profession specifically is by providing training and education. Um, specifically in credentials, webinars, trainings. Um, we also have an annual education conference, which I'll share a little bit um, more about. And then of course, we have our Journal of Environmental Health, um, which actually just also published uh, Critical Competencies in Children's EH, which was work done by Children's Environmental Health Committee. That's part of the environmental health section of this group which was uh, really well received. We've gotten a lot of um, positive feedback um, about that publication. Um, we also do um, have a cooperative agreement with CDC and FDA, which supports the workforce in a lot of different areas from climate to emergency preparedness, data and informatics. Uh, we have a fabulous leadership academy, um, which supports about 30 mid-level supervisors in the U.S. to really um, get more skills becoming leaders in environmental health. We have a Brownfields Environmental Health Land Reuse, Food Safety, LED Program, Student Internships, and Water Safety Programs as well, so have a lot going on there. And then I'm really sad that you can't see <laughs> this last slide um, because it has a little graphic and everything. But um, like I said, part of the work that we do is our annual educational conference. And that's going to be held this year, July 31st through August 3rd in New Orleans. In New Orleans. Um, I do wanna put a plug out that if you haven't registered for that yet, I think we are going to be able to give out some at least registration um, scholarships, hopefully in the next couple of months to folks if you're a state tribal, um, local or territorial um, with a jurisdiction. So we'll have some of those coming out, but it's really a great way for folks to get together, learn what's going on, as well as the networking I think is really, really um, valuable. So I'll stop sharing my one screen there and uh, pass it back to you. Thank you, Gina. That's really nice. And um, yeah, apologies about the tech thing. Hopefully we can get the slides and we'll share that with the section. Um, I'm, I'm already anticipating folks might ask for emails. So of course I have all your emails and I'm wondering if anyone does not want to particularly share their email. I, sometimes there might be a reason, but otherwise I'd like to kind of share that with folks because I'm guessing we might have questions. Um, that might be one of the biggest questions we have. What's, what are your folks' contact details? So hopefully that's okay with the speakers. If not, you can send me a private message and I'll, I won't share them right this second, but I'll wait a little bit to hear from you um, if that's the case. So just to um, go to our last speaker today, uh, we actually have two speakers, if I understand correctly. Um, we have Mark Shiamoto and Dr. Gabriel Filippelli. Um, they're going to be speaking on behalf of the American Geophysical Union. So I'll introduce um, each of them now, and then we'll let, hand over the baton to them. So Mark Shiamoto is the Director of Global Outreach at AGU, 
In this capacity, Mark oversees the strategic growth and coordination of programs, partnerships, and initiatives to serve AGU's global community of Earth and space scientists. Dr. Gabriel um, Felipe is a Chancellor's Professor of Earth Sciences at, and the Executive Director, sorry, Filippelli, Filippelli, of the Indiana University Environmental Resilience Institute. Filippelli is a bio geochemist with broad training in climate change, exposure science, and environmental health. He's the editor-in-chief for the journal GeoHealth, published by AGU. So I'll go ahead and stop there um, with the bios, and I'll hand the floor over to our AGU colleagues. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Charles. And uh, thank you, everyone, for having us today. Um, APHA and the environmental section were the first professional society I ever joined. So it very feels much like coming home. Um, so it's good to see some familiar faces as well as some new ones as well. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of some things that are happening at AGU. And then we're very, uh, I'm very lucky to be joined by Gabe Filippelli, who will be giving some more information specific to the GeoHealth Journal. Um, so to kind of start things off, um, and we kind of talked about the name a little earlier, but it is the American Geophysical Union. We're not American, uh, we're not just geophysics, and we're also not a union. So similar to some of the other conversations, a great name for us, um, but it really does cover the swath of earth and space sciences. Our committee of over half a million uh, earth scientists and expertise make up uh, folks who are members or um, our 800 plus editors or editor in chiefs, um, over 50,000 authors across our publications. Um, and our community overall um, is in over 134 countries. Um, so a really large breadth of technical expertise that span really deep knowledge all the way to solution science from kind of layers of Earth's center core all the way to planets outside of our uh, uh, planetary system. So very exciting, very broad. I've learned a lot in my five years at AGU, I'm still learning every day. Um, but such strong connections to a lot of the issues in particular that this section cares about. Um, so that's kind of AGU at large. I thought I would highlight a few things that may be more specific and more new that um, this section may be most interested in. Um, one being in 2020, we launched, uh, similarly to some of the other conversations, a new strategic plan, and that has three main goals to A, um, continue great discovery science, but also elevate and improve our access and information on solutions-based science. Two, ensure we're doing that kind of work inclusive and diverse, um, and ensuring that we look at the full spectrum of what it means to conduct science. Um, and then lastly, to partner broadly. And we're very fortunate to have APHA as one of our partners through different initiatives. Um, but similarly looking beyond. Um, and with that new uh, strategic uh, approach, um, one area, you know, climate change is something that is very much important to our community. And um, one kind of more community led initiative that we launched last year that is underway and we're working really closely with the United Nations and um, other global leaders to help understand is this concept around climate interventions, kind of formally known as uh, geoengineering. Um, AGU is not really in the business of looking for or endorsing any kind of climate interventions, but what we do feel is important and we have a strong basis um, and history of is science ethics. And so we are working on developing an ethical framework on what a future would look like in climate interventions, what questions ne are needed to be asked. Um, dissimilar to a lot of health sciences, uh, earth sciences is less uh, purview to IRB or some of those other ethical protocols, um, not saying that they don't follow ethics, um, there's just less of a structure and in particular in an area of climate engineering there's a lot of interdependencies and a lot of concerns, rightfully so. And so for the next year we're um, embarking on kind of a bit of a listening tour to get very broad feedback and information on what 
concerns, what needs, what questions should be posed before any research is done, and even potential deployment, which we hear is often kind of happening already in areas that we definitely do not want to have a negative impact for, especially as we're all trying to address the climate crisis. So that's one. Um, and two, um, and this was already hinted by uh, uh, Jennifer from CSA, um, there is the Community Science Exchange, which is a community of partners who have come together to share best practices on citizen science, community science, and ways that we can work from our collective uh, uh, communities to better understand that co-creation of knowledge, value that knowledge, and provide a home that um, allows that information to be disseminated in a credible peer-reviewed fashion. And so APHA is a member of the Community Science Exchange. They have an associate editor on the Community Science uh, Journal, as does CSA, to really start to build this um, culture of science, inclusive culture of science that I think we all are aspiring to engage in as we know the product will likely be more successful in the end. Um, Next, I wanted to highlight a meeting that's happening in June, and there is actually a call for abstracts open right now, and it closes March 1st, and that is a meeting on climate and health for Africa. It is a research meeting, but it's it's at that nexus of research and policy that's really looking to galvanize the best available science as well as the best available um, local African knowledge to create early warning systems, forecasting, et cetera, to better understand um, and predict health uh, vulnerabilities across different countries in Africa. Ironically, it will be in DC. Um, however, there is a large contingent of African scientists and practitioners who will be coming um, to DC to engage. It will not be virtual, unfortunately, because they felt they wanted to create one small room of discussion and everyone had a perspective. Um, and so I encourage you to check out that meeting, um, at least perhaps outcomes of that meeting, um, as I hope that the information, especially from a global sense, will be very applicable to informing and reducing risk. Um, and then lastly, and I will note, I have URLs for all of these and I'm gonna drop them into the notes if that's okay. Um, so you have that. Um, and then lastly, GeoHealth. I think many of you hopefully are aware that this has been a, a growing capacity since um, 2017 at AGU where it is now a full-fledged membership section. It's a journal, um, but it's also a, avenue and um, way that the AGU community can galvanize, but more importantly, identify partnerships and opportunities to galvanize with others who have been leading in the space or have other uh, forms of contributions to advance the dialogue. Um, and so I have some links that kind of update how to know more about what the section's doing, um, follow them on Twitter. One, two things I wanted to note as section activities is one is uh, the GeoHealth section next month, I believe, is partnering with the American Meteorological Society's Environment and Health section to develop ways that they can showcase some of the science that came out of their last two meetings. Our annual meetings in December, AMS is in January, and they kind of wanted a way to keep presenting that knowledge. And so there'll be a virtual webinar um, happening next month. Um, and then in addition, also kind of exciting, um, last year, NS, or the year before maybe, NSF approached AGU and some other partners wanting to better understand what are these kind of environmental health science needs, where are the limitations, where are the gaps in teaching, education, research, funding, up to practice and success. Um, and so uh, we had a workshop to inform kind of what recommendations could form out of a series of talks and um, analysis analyses. Um, and that shaped to be a report to NSF um, that is online and available um, and hopefully a good resource uh, to inform maybe your own planning as well as maybe some outreach to policymakers or other, uh, uh, whether it's domestic or outside the US. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Gabe to wrap it up with uh, more information on our exciting journal. Thanks so much, Mark, and thanks for the invitation to, to join everyone. The GeoHealth Journal started in 2017. It was actually kickstarted by um, 
by Rita Caldwell, former uh, director of National Science Foundation, seeing a real need to uh, to have public uh, publication at the intersection of environmental processes sort of writ large and human health also writ large. So probably the closest parallel would be EHP um, uh, journal, except uh, our, our journal that tends to publish things that um, are much more on the environment realm uh, rather than uh, explicitly in, in, the, in the health area. So we launched in 2017 and initially like all new journals is a little bit slow to, slow to go. Uh, but um, it's uh, it's kind of exploded over the last couple of years. Um, it's uh, highly cited uh, as a has an extremely strong impact factor, uh, and and also I think probably most importantly for us, it, it's it's our chance to be the voice of sort of the geo health section, or at least the topic that come up in a section, uh, our our voice to publicize that science more broadly. So uh, our our papers tend to. Um, tend to be international in scope. The papers that are published are editorial boards international in scope. And um, one of the one of the things that I, I love seeing is it's it's one of the one of these journals that oh, it's picked up pretty frequently in the media, the papers are because they're of they're of relevance, right? And, and and like a lot of these things, you know, society is is coming to grips with the, that intersection between the environment and health, whether it's in the climate space or the air quality space or the equity space. We have a number of special collections that actually focus on on various topics, including uh, issues like air quality in Africa and, and Asia, including um, equity itself and community science. And we have a, a very close partnership with the community science journal, but the one that Mark described earlier. Uh, and we're kind of scoping through ways that we can um, we can complement each other. And um, and the, but. Having said that, this is my last year as editor in chief of the journal. My term expires, uh, so you'll see another face here. But I would also love and welcome this community to consider uh, whether there are, are leaders in the in the sort of the geo health area, or environmental health area, who would be interested in becoming editor in chief. The search is beginning shortly. I think next month or so. So uh, we'd love love the opportunity to get that advertisement out far and wide through this community as well. So thank you. Oops, great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, AGU. Um, so I think we're going to just go ahead and 